Somebody asked me the other day, what did I think was the, the greatest problem in our churches today? And, <clears throat> and I said, apathy. It's, it's apathy. Would you, you know? And he said, well, he started to disagree with that. And then he said, well, well okay, I guess so. <laughs> then the second, <laughs> what do you think the second biggest problem is? He wanted me to say people being judgmental. He wanted, that's what he thinks until, until I said apathy. That's what was on his mind. Christian people are judgmental and an unsafe world don't want any part of that. And, uh, and that's true, but I don't, I don't know that that's our greatest problem. In, in the church, I don't, not, not saying here, I'm just saying across the board, um, and even here to, to an extent, it's, it's apathy. And if you wonder, if you wonder, you know, man, you know, the pastor picks at us a lot. Well, I know, um, but, but I, I don't ever want us, me, I don't ever want you, me, all of us to, to just relax. I'm just happy where I'm at. I just, that's not what it's about. These, um, the, the song, the song that mom played there was, was, um, was really, really good. That second stanza of that, the blood will never lose its power. It soothes my doubts. It soothes my, it soothes my doubt and calms my fears. And it dries all my tears. The blood that gives me strength from day to day will never lose its power. So, so true. And, uh, and then that other one. Did you think about these words as you sung them? Because I'm going to repeat them here. The love of God. The last verse. Could we, and think about how this is written. Could we with ink the ocean fill? That's a lot of ink. That's a, it's a lot of ink. And were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God ab above, would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. That gives me chills, because that is so true. Y you know God's infinite, right? We know that, right? God, God's infinite. He's infinite. His love is infinite. We may say, oh, I understand the love of God. No, we don't. We understand what God was able to give to us. We only understand what He was able, what He gave to us, because He said, they'll never get, they'll never get, on this earth down here in a sinful, in a, with a sinful nature, it's always pulling at them, always tugging at them. They're never going to get the true depth. And I will spend, if, I will spend eternity teaching them the depth of the love of God. I believe that. And uh, so, you know, as we sing these good old songs, these oldie but goodies, you know, let's not, let's not just, uh, uh, you know, just... Sing it and not think about what we're singing. Um, all right. Talking about the church tonight, we're going to continue uh, with that. Um, somebody tell me what the Greek word for church is in the New Testament. The Greek word. Anybody remember? Ecclesia, right? Ecclesia. Did you, did you hear Brother Minton mention that this morning? I think he mentioned it in here. Ecclesia. And uh, that actually means a called out assembly. And I want you to be, I want you to not, I, I, want, I want you to learn that. I don't want you to just hear it in one service and think, oh, that's kind of neat. No, we are a called out assembly. And you can only, you know, we are to assemble together, to call out into a different place and assemble together. That's what that means. And that's the importance, or that's what the local new church is about um, as far as uh, assembling. Um, last week we, we talked about uh, the, the body of Christ, which is the church, the, the worldwide church, a universal church. There is a body, and, and all believers are part of the same body. 
And then there is also, though, the local New Testament church, and that's us. And the, the local New Testament church should be the manifestation of the uh, of Jesus. And give me a second, because I'm heating up up here. I want to drop this. There we go. That'll help. So the local New Testament church is a manifestation of Jesus Christ. That's the reason why, that's the reason why sin in the church, you know, uh, you know for, for a person in the church who just lives their lives like there is no God, the Bible actually says those kind of people right there, the church needs to address them. Because they, they, look, they're taking my name in vain. They're saying, I am a Christian. And then they go out and live like Satan. And God says, I'm, that, that is not, the church and the people of the church are supposed to, to uh, uh, they are supposed to speak as ambassadors, speak for me and really let God speak through us. So, uh, anyhow. The local New Testament church, and mainly that's what this study is about. And, and determining, look, folks, is it essential or is it not? Is it or is it not? And that's what you, and I believe that the scriptures tell us, I believe that God tells us that the local church is essential. Okay? And it's not something that, it's not one of the things that God does. It's the only thing he's doing. Now, there's a lot of moving pieces in that, what I just said. But it's the only thing he's doing is building the kingdom of God. Point three, I've already touched on this. I won't spend as much time on it tonight, but... Uh, point number three, overall point number three in our study is where did the church have its beginning? And, I, and I've, co I've covered this, but I'm just going to hit it again quickly tonight. But most people's answer would be the book of Acts. You know, after, after Jesus ascended and the people went um, into the upper room and prayed, and Jesus says, go up there and pray until the, the Holy Ghost is sent to you. And it was on the day of Pentecost, 50 days later, it was sent to them. Peter preaches, and, and what, 3,000 people get saved that day, and were added to the church 3,000 people. That tells you that the church already existed. In God's mind, it already existed. And we talked about that. Remember how that the church is a called out assembly, right? And we talked about when the, Jesus actually began the church when he called Matthew out. He called Peter out, James and John, and said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He called them out and they, and they walked away. They, they left everything behind and they walked away. Well, that is a calling out. And we talked about that Jesus has that authority. And Jesus began his church with the disciples who later became apostles. We talked about that. But I want to go back... And, and, and re-emphasize tonight that the church actually had its beginning in the mind of God from forever, from the ancient of days, as the Scripture would say. We've got to understand, folks, that the church is not man's idea. And some people will make the statement, well... I don't, I don't like organized religion. Well, you know what I say to that? Well, then you don't like God's, you don't like the mind of God. Because you don't like God's ideas. And I, I mean, most people that make the statements that I'm getting ready to make, they're the people that, don't, that are not in church. And they're coming up with a defense. As to why I'm not in, I don't like organized religion because man just gets in there, it's just all messed up. It's just a bunch of hypocrites gathering together. And that's the reason why they don't go to church. People will say, I worship God in my own way. How many of you have ever heard somebody make that statement? I worship God in my own way. No, you won't. <laughs> no, you won't. You may think, okay, even if you are worshiping God, my guess is you're probably not even worshiping God. 
But even if you do and you say, well, I've got my own way of worshiping God. No, not if it's, hey, if it's outside of this book, God's not being worshiped. Whatever you're doing, what, and, and here again, I'm preaching to the choir. You understand when I say that, what that means? Uh, it means I'm preaching to the people that probably already believe what I'm saying. So when I say I'm preaching to the choir, that's what that means. And you're here on Wednesday night, and you know what that tells me? You believe the church is essential. So, so, so understand, okay, but, okay, but, you're the people that's here. <laughs> and it's like Jesus taught the disciples, and sometimes He taught them hard things. Well, they were there. But He had to teach that truth so the truth could get out. People say, I worship God in my own way. No, you don't. You either worship God in His way or you don't worship God at all. Uh, people will say, you do God, and I hate the way they word this stuff, but I'm going to say it because, it because I hear this. You do God how you want to, and I will do God how I want to. It's basically the same way of saying I worship Him however I want to worship Him. These are statements that are made by people that do not go to church, and they are a defense mechanism for reasons why they don't go to church. Church began, the idea of church began in the mind of God from the very beginning before it ever was, before there ever was a solar system and a sun and before God created any of this that we see and that we experience. The, the, the church was a, was a, was a, uh, you know, was a truth. It was an entity that God said, I'm going to have a thing called the church. And that'll be in the New Testament time of after, after the death of my son and the ascension. And I'm going to start something up called the church. And it will, it will be the focus for all believers in New Testament time. It is the focus of, it should be, of all believers. And, and when we say... Well, you know, I just think church is, be very careful because you're getting ready to criticize God's idea. Not a good thing to do. You know, that, that's, that's, not a, that's not a good step to take. Is to criticize what God says the way I think things should happen and the way I think things should run. And the church is God's idea. It's not man's. But... People have been, for a long time, people have been criticizing God's ideas. Happens now today. It happens even in churches. Even people that come to church three times a week, sometimes they, they get off on something and, and, you know, they start acting in such a way. And, and, and it's, it's rejecting the mind of God. It's rejecting, and it's, and it's actually a, the way, sometimes the way we live our lives is a criticism of His ways. 1 Samuel 8, 7 says, And the Lord told him, talking about Samuel, Listen to all the people, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. The people had a king, and it was God. And he spoke through Samuel to the people. And the people said, now Samuel messed up. And see, that, that's, that, this is always the case. It's not that God's ways don't work. It's that we mess them up. Samuel had two sons that he put in charge, and they were hearing, and they, and they were making judgments in the land to help him carry the load. And they were wicked sons. And because they were wicked, and because they could be bribed, and they were, look, they were looking at it and using their position to get rich and to make money, do favors, that wearied the people. So much so that they went to Samuel and said, we don't like this. We want a king. So, and, but, but God, and Samuel was very, was very discouraged by that. And God just said, look, don't, you're fine. You're fine. Uh, because what they're doing, they're rejecting me. They're rejecting my idea. So we need to be very careful about how we treat the church and uh, that we don't, we don't reject the idea of God. It's a very polarizing truth that church is essential. Very polarizing. Uh, there are a lot of issues in church that are essential. Number one, I'm sorry, that are polarizing. Number one is how people dress. 
Now let me get up here and preach a real hot sermon on the way I think people should dress. And it's going to be a polarizing, going to have a polarizing effect. Some people are going to say amen and some people are going to say, get out of my closet. <laughs> you ain't got no business telling me what to, dress, you know, what to wear. Alcohol and the use of alcohol, a very polarizing thing. And it's something that I see people that, that, you know, at one time maybe they grow up in a very conservative family and they believe what the Scripture teaches, which is that alcohol is wrong. Alcohol is wrong. You say, yeah, but pastor, listen, listen, you don't, you don't understand there are a lot of different words in the Bible for wine. A lot of different Hebrew words in the Old Testament that are translated wine in the English. There's a lot of different words in the Greek in the New Testament that are translated wine. We read them right across the board and we say, oh, they're all the same. Guess what? They're not all the same. Sometimes the word wine in the Scripture means grape juice, unfermented. Sometimes wine in the Bible speaks of a paste. They would boil down grape juice and into a paste form, boil all the liquid out of it. And then they would store that. And then they would bring that out, add water to it. Remember the old, uh, how you used to make orange juice and, and grape juice? It would be a frozen concentrate, right? Am I right? Am I remembering right? Get the can over now, take the one side off, or maybe cut both sides and push it out, and you'd add water to it, mix it up, and what? You'd have a, you'd have whatever, you'd have a half a gallon or whatever it made. They did that in the Bible times to help store to help store the, the, the fruit of the vine. They would cook it down and, and cook out all the, uh, all the uh, uh, water out of it. And it became a paste. And they would, they would store that. Then they would get it out and add water to it. And just like we did, used to do. And then they have grape juice. So don't just say, well, I read the verses. You can't, you can't make that decision. There's a lot going on there. And if you say, well, I really want to know, I have some very good reading for you. But nevertheless, um, nevertheless, alcohol is a big deal. Don't tell me what I can drink. Don't, 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 you know, don't tell me. Uh, hairstyles, you know, big deal. And you know what? And I don't go, I, I don't go after these a whole lot. And I, I, I do alcohol a little bit. The other stuff I don't go after a whole lot. Money. Don't tell me what to do with my money. <laughs> Polarizing things is what I'm talking about. Polarizing. Service. Service for God can be a polarizing thing. Uh, but church is definitely a polarizing topic. And there are those who say, I'll, do, I'll worship God my way, and I'm not going to go down there and join them hypocrites. Okay. Well, you're not going to worship God, but okay. And then there are those who say that, I believe in Sunday morning. You know, don't talk to me. The Bible doesn't say anything about Sunday night, Wednesday night. You know, I'll come Sunday morning. Okay. You know, and then there's you. You know, you're here. And, uh, and you believe in, you know, mostly, hey, if the doors are open, I'm kind of going to be there. You know, we, we believe that the world is full of a bunch of wickedness and we believe that our own nature is, is, is uh, prone to wander and leave the God I love. And we believe that church is a good thing and, and we need it and we need it multiple days a week. Okay, moving right along. We've got, look folks, we have got to do things here God's way. Do we, do we as, as conservative, independent Baptists, do we believe in women pastors? No, we do not. You know why? Because there's scripture that says that a woman in the church is not to have authority over the man. You say, well, I just don't. Well, then, then criticize God. You're not criticizing me. If I make that statement and you don't agree with it, it's like Samuel and God. God tells me, don't worry about it. Just preach, preach the Word and give them the Word. And if they criticize you, they're really not criticizing you, they're criticizing me. We don't believe in women pastors. Even though I'll guarantee you that there are some women pastors that probably do a good job. 
But that's not the point. The point is that God says that women are not going to have a position of authority over a man in the church. They're not going to be the teacher of men in the church. It doesn't matter how logical in our minds we seem to make it. We don't believe in women deacons. Okay? And I'll guarantee you this. We have some women in our church that would make great deacons. But that's not the point. Right? The point is that God says that a deacon shall be the husband of one wife. Well, that means a man. That, that's why we believe what we believe. You say, yeah, I know, but that, but that lady there, she's more godly than everybody in the church. Even, even more godly than the pastor. That may be so. But that's not God's idea. It's not God's idea. Leadership qualifications. As much as possible, we use what the Scripture says for pastors, for deacons. You know, the qualifications listed in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we go by them first. Why? Because that's God's idea. As Baptists, as conservative, independent Baptists, we try as much as we can, and we are fallible, but we try as much as we can to get our doctrine, our leading, our uh, all from God. Scripture. And then, and then let the chips fall where they fall after that. All right, next point, point number four. So we just talked about there um, that church, church has a beginning where? In the mind of God way back when it's His idea and we have no business fighting against it. Number four, what is the role? Now, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. This is, um, but, it, but it's a topic that I got on and I went ahead and followed it out and I could put it anywhere in this series. But tonight, what is the role of the Trinity in the formation and work of the church what is the role of the Trinity? Look, church is such a big deal that every member of the Trinity is part of it. God the Father, God the... and God the... Holy Spirit. Three... Three persons. Not one that appears in three different modes, but three distinct persons. Do you know that the word Trinity never appears in the Bible? Not in the King James Version. Trinity never appears. If you look the word Trinity up in the dictionary, it will say that the term is a group of three. A group of three. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. 1 John 5, 7 says, For there are three that bear a record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. These three are one. It's, it's somewhat of a mystery that we can't truly, can't truly wrap our minds around how that is. I'm going to give you a really good illustration tonight that's one of the better ones that I've heard uh, in my lifetime. But we see, now open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. And if anybody ever says, well, I don't believe, you know, well, I just think God's just one, and he, sometimes He presents Himself as the Father, and sometimes He presents Himself as the Son, and, you know, that's not true. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 3, look at verse 16. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, and it says, And Jesus, when He was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto Him, and He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon Him. So right away we have two members of the Trinity present. Jesus, right? Jesus is there. We see the Holy Spirit descending like a dove upon Jesus. That's two. Two distinct, different entities. Verse 17, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Well, who is that? That's the Father. So we have Jesus that's there. He's coming up out of the water. 
That's God the Son. We have the Holy Spirit descending upon Him at that point right then. That's God the Holy Spirit. That's two. And then we have God the Father speaking and saying, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. If you ever are challenged about that, just pull that out and say, Well, then, well, then how, how is this possible? You have all three present in the same passage of Scripture right here. Dr. Charles Stanley says, Scripture shows how each member of the Trinity fulfills his specific role. God the Father. The function of the Father. By His very title of Father and His label as the first person of the Trinity, it is, it is manifest that His function is superior to the Son. God does descending. Galatians 4, 4 and 5, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent His Son. God does descending. God does the planning and God does the sending. Okay? Function of the Son. Now these are the functions in within... Well, it's, it's the function of God, of the Trinity, but I also want you to relate this, how this function operates in the church. The Son, on the other hand, is the means. He's the sent one. He's the one that accomplishes the plan of God. God said, this is my plan. God the Father says, this is the plan. And here's where we're going. And, and, and Jesus says, and God says, and I'm going to send you, Jesus, to earth to accomplish it. My plan, I do the sending, Jesus, you will be sent by me to earth and you will die on the cross and you will get the work done. You'll do the heavy lifting there if you, if you will. So, so Jesus does the accomplishing on the cross. John 17, 4 says, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Here again, the Father does the sending, and the, and the Son is the one being sent to do the will of the Father. Jesus says, I don't have any uh, references here, but they're easy to find. Jesus often, many times said, I do the will of the one that sent me. I speak only the things that I hear Him speak. Boy, how about that? Can we say that? We can't. I mean, I can't. I'd like to be able to tell you that I never misspeak. <laughs> I've probably misspoken already in this service tonight. Jesus says, I never misspeak. I say only the things that the Father wants me to say. Pretty incredible. God the Father does the planning. Jesus executes the plan. He accomplishes the plan. And then the Holy Spirit... He is, he is likewise in subordination to the plan of the Father. He is the one who indwells us. We know Him uh, under, under names of comforter, teacher, rebuker, author of the Scriptures, counselor, and so on and so on. He is the one that empowers the church. God's plan, it was God's idea... And he planned it, planned everything, including the church. Jesus executes the plan, and the Holy Spirit empowers the plan. He is the one, he's the one that as you talk to somebody, he is the one as somebody watches a, a, a sermon on the internet and, and they're preaching and, 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 and there's something inside of the person that says you need to listen to this guy, he's speaking the truth, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. He empowers the work of the church. It's God's plan for this church right here at 3100 Courthouse Road. And it was God's plan from, from before anything ever was for this church to come into existence in 1969 and uh, for it to go from the cabinet shop to, to this property and then in, in 2022, for it still to be in existence, and for God saying, I still am working in that church, and we're going to do the will of, and, and that church is going to do my will, my plans going. And, and Jesus is the head of the church, and the Holy Spirit has been sent to inside of each one of us to empower our work. 
to empower us as we allow God to do His work through us. God the Father plans it. Jesus executed the plan. And the Holy Spirit in, empowers the plan. Luke 24, 49 says this, Jesus talking, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Jesus says, don't go out and try to start this thing called the New Testament church in your own power. Because you're never going, it's never going to happen. He says, Acts 1.8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you should be witnesses uh, of me, uh, witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. He says, "I'm going to build my church, but the Holy Spirit will be the one that builds it." We are simply a conduit. We're just a conduit. We're, we're a raceway for the Holy Spirit, through which the Holy Spirit will work and convict people around us. And He will build the church. He's the one that convicts. He's the one that calls people to God, not us. You know, some people will say, yeah, well, I got a lot of charisma. You know, I can get the job done. No, you can't. If the Holy Spirit's not empowering that charisma, all you'll do is win somebody to yourself. That's all. And God won't get the glory and God's work won't be accomplished. Here's the illustration I wanted to give you in trying to understand. Okay, so what's the point about it? The roles of the Trinity in the church. Well, okay, okay, fine. What's the big deal? The big deal is that that is the work of God going on in this world. It is building the kingdom of God and trying to deliver as many people that will out of the, out of the pit of hell of eternity and to bring them back into a right relationship with Him. That's what God is doing. That's not one thing that He's doing. That is what He is doing. That was the entirety of Jesus' work on this earth as God manifested Himself to the world through His Son, in, uh, incarnate God in the flesh. That was what was happening. And what's happening now? is that God is all, His work is simply this. I'm trying to win back the world as many that will, because we have a free choice, many that will receive my Son and be reunited with me for eternity. That's, that's all I'm doing. If we think that God's doing anything else, He's not. Everything revolves around that right there. You say, well, he's trying to glorify himself. And we've covered this before. He is trying to glorify himself. Why? So that to draw people to himself. That's why. He's not up there. He's not this pride, proudful and arrogant. Look, that's Satan. Don't get God and Satan mixed up. Satan is one that says, I will lift myself up and I'll be just like him. And God says, no, you won't. In the work, in it, what, what God is building his kingdom. And when he is glorified, then he, meaning that he, he, has, um, he has been manifested to unsaved people. And they look and say, wow. They ask you, why are you so happy? Why, why, why do you go to church? Why, why do you seem to get through the things that, that are derailing everybody else, but you seem to get through them? Not to say that you're perfect, but you seem to get through them. And when we say, right there, that is glorifying God. And that is this little light of mine, I will let it shine. That is God manifesting Himself through us to a world, and others will, so, will say, really? Well, tell me, tell me about that. What is that? And you tell them what a great God that you serve, and what a great God that came down that loves them so much that the Father sent His Son down to down the cross for their sins. 
And the Holy Spirit's now saying, you listen, that's, now that's truth. That's truth. And you need to grab a hold of that and make it your own. That's the work that God is doing in this world. Now, I know that He's directing events in the world too, according to His plan, you know. But I'm telling you right now, what's God doing? He's trying to save mankind. That's what He's trying to do. And there's going to come a time at the rapture, which is, who knows? Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon. You know that song? Coming again, coming again. Oh, what a glorious day it will be when Jesus comes back for us. And we need to be sharing that word with people. Because the Trinity says we're all tied up in this one thing, and that's, that's the building of the church, the building of the body of Christ in, in its entirety around the world. And how does, how, how does that accomplish? Through the local New Testament church. And the Father is invested in it. It's His plan. And that's what He's doing. I wonder what God's doing today, building His church. Jesus executed it when He came down and died on the cross. And the Holy Spirit empowers it now through us, living inside of us. One last uh, illustration here. I keep saying I'm going to hit it, and now I am. Aspen trees. How many of you heard of an aspen tree? Right? I mean, we've all at least heard of it. Do you know how the aspen tree reproduces? Seeds, but not primarily. Primarily, it's, 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 it's roots. It has a root system, right? Every tree's got roots. Well, the, the roots of the aspen tree grow, grow down and they grow out and they grow out. And then maybe, maybe 10 feet or 15 feet or whatever away, a, a sucker will be produced from a root. In other words, it's part of the root. And it comes up and it grows into a tree. You follow what I'm saying? Uh, yes, they can reproduce from seeds, but that's not the primary way. The primary way is this one tree that might have began from a seed, well, who, who knows how long ago. Now its roots spread out, and then, a, and, then a, and then another tree from its very own root of this tree will come off of that root and come up and will sprout and will become a tree. And it goes on and on and on. And they say that... Most likely the largest living organism on earth is a 100 acre, acre uh, clonal or genetically identical stand of quaking aspens in fish, near Fish Lake, Utah. 100 acres of aspen trees that all are interrelated under the ground. In other words, you, you'll have 50 out here, and all 50 will have the exact same DNA as one another because they're not separate. And that's a, that's a pretty good illustration of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. That's, that's kind of a good illustration for that is that they all three have the same DNA. They all three think exactly alike because they have that same, they're, they're all from the same root. They all, they're part. One did not give birth to another. Look, as a man said, I was watching something this week. He said, um, don't think that God made Jesus. God the Father. There was never a, a little Jesus Jr. running around up, up in heaven. The Bible teaches that Jesus always was, just as the Father always was. And that whole begotten word there, it's not what you think that it means. And I've been, I put several hours into studying it this week, and I'm still not quite sure that it's kind of a mystery also. He is the Son of God. But God never made him. He always was with God. There's scripture that bears that out. And, and maybe we'll talk about that sometime. Very interesting. But the Trinity, the Trinity, God 
in three persons, and they are all about one thing, and that is building the church. Building the kingdom of God. So if that's what they are all about, then that's what we should be all about. And I understand that life requires certain things. You know, Dickie works a job. I'm fortunate enough, privileged enough that I can work doing this here. You know, people work jobs. Rick, Rick works jobs. I've got a lot of retired people in here. But sure, there's a lot of things. But look, even in the working of that job, as you cross paths with people, those are meeting points uh, between a believer and possibly a non-believer that Jesus says, tell them about me. Do something. Give them something. It's all, everything in our lives as the Trinity is all about the local church, show so should we. Okay, let's pray. Father, I please help us now as we as we as we look at this thing called the church and the, the thing, the thing that was purchased with the blood of Christ, the thing that is that is what you that is what you are doing. Wonder what God's doing today. Well, we know, we know that you are building your church. And, and you're, you're using us. You're using us. So help us to understand the importance of the church. And I thank God for these that are here tonight to do. And bless them for their faithfulness. But challenge us all this week to do the works that you have given us to do. To be witnesses, to be ambassadors. Telling people about Jesus and telling people about the church and what the church is all about. Why do we do this thing? Why do we leave and give time morning and evening uh, at church? We need to have good answers about that and, and, and tell people that it is essential. God bless our people now for being here. Give them a great week. Father, watch over them. Protect them. Keep them safe this week for those that are sick and hurting. Meet their needs. For those that are not here tonight, the same. God, uh, uh, work in their hearts and lives. And above all, though, above all, may we see you every day of our lives. May we get a, a clear vision, not anything weird, but just from reading your word and the Holy Spirit teaching us. May we learn more about you and get a more clear vision every day of our lives about about you and, and, and increase in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and to be about as Jesus said when Jesus got separated father you put that story in the Bible 12 years of age he got separated from his parents and father it took them a while to figure it out but it finally dawned on them why don't we check the temple and Jesus said I've been here the whole time I'm so glad you gave us that example and he said, wouldn't you know? Wouldn't it have dawned on you? Why didn't you look here first? Wouldn't you know that I would be about my father's business? And Father, help us to have, to be like Jesus, even as a 12-year-old, to be like Jesus and to be about your business. Father, bless our people now. Please meet, our need, meet their needs. Meet the needs of this church, as I know that you will, and help us to be about the building of your church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Good night.